Hello, hello, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really excited for this conversation. It's going to be a really good one. Um, my name is Jenny Garrett and today we're going to be talking about can you truly lead if you are not an ally? Um, so welcome. Uh, please feel free to tell us where you are in the world. Um, we look forward to knowing where you are, where you're from. Um, uh, just in case you don't know me, I'm an award-winning career coach, author, and leadership trainer. And together with my team, we deliver impactful development to those from underrepresented groups to progress at work, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as supporting all leaders to make inclusion happen. My latest recently award-winning book um, is called Equality Versus Equity, Tackling Issues of Race in the Workplace. I also want to say a big thank you on behalf of my social enterprise, Rocking Your Teens. Your donations will go towards increasing resilience, inspiring and raising aspirations in teenagers. And if anyone wants to find out more about Rocking Your Teens, I will add the URL for them uh, into the chat a little bit later on. So it's great to be here. Um, you know, the question that we're asking, uh, can you really be an ally? Uh, if you are, can you really be a leader if you're not an ally is a good question. And is it one that you've asked yourself previously? I think the question challenges the status quo and forces us to confront the reality that in a world that is currently grappling with lots of injustice and inequality, actually the way through to get more equitable organizations is for us all to be a part of the solution. Um, so in today's session, we're going to think about how we can move beyond performative allyship, and we will explain what we mean by performative, but ultimately we want to know how to move beyond empty gestures and take meaningful action, um, how we can bridge the gap between words and deeds, um, we all say the right thing. Um, we all think we're doing the right thing, but perhaps we're not. And there's more that we can do. And also unlock the full potential of the workforce. Um, how can you create a culture where everyone feels valued, respected and empowered to contribute their very best? Um, so to do this, I have some great coaches with me today. Hira Ali, Jessica Rogers, Joseph Obonna and Ishreen Bradley. They're all listed in the Diverse Executive Coach Directory, a directory which connects corporate organizations with coaches from the global majority, or you might want to say ethnically diverse backgrounds. And we are going to be discussing this very important question. So the format of the session is that here at Jess, Joseph and Ishreen will briefly introduce themselves I'll start off by asking them some questions and then we'll open it up to you for your questions and reflections. We'll do our best to keep an eye on the chat throughout as well. Um, so please do interact, uh, whether you're just saying hi to one of the speakers, whether you've got some insight yourself or whether you've got some great questions to pose, don't wait till the end, put them in the chat as we go um, so we can be thinking about them and make sure that we get to them. Um, we always like you to share on socials and we are live on LinkedIn. So um, you please feel free to use the hashtag lead through allyship um, and tag us all and um, we'll definitely respond to you. So I want to start with you, Hira. Please can you introduce yourself? Thank you, Jenny. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hira Ali. I'm an executive coach, a leadership development and allyship specialist and trainer and speaker. I'm also the founder of a company known as Advancing Your Potential, where we champion allyship programs and inclusive talent management initiatives. I'm the author of two books. I always say this, popular books I'd like to believe, Her Way to the Top, A Guide to Smashing the Glass Ceiling. And the second book is on allyship and it's called Her Allies, A Practical Toolkit to Help Men Lead Through Advocacy. Thank you, Hira. That was wonderful. I'll hear from Joseph next. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good to be here. I'm Joseph Obodna. I'm a leadership and executive coach. 
I treasure wisdom and I love coming across people who surprise themselves in what they can transcend to become. Um, I also value strategic thinking. Um, fun fun um, information about me is I've just started learning to play the harp. Huh. Thank you. I love that, Joseph. Especially, I love someone who plays the harp, that plays modern songs with the harp. So I'm looking forward to that. Maybe my next birthday. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll go to Jess next. Hi, everyone. Hi, Jenny. It's lovely to be here. So I'm a certified executive coach and leadership development facilitator. And I work a lot with leaders and those who want to be leaders as well. Um, and so I help them to, to lead better, to really create like equi equi equitable workplaces. And I do this with one-to-one -one coaching, group coaching and leadership development programs. And the key thing for me in all of the work I do is to help people to use their voices effectively so that they can really make positive change and do good. Um, because I really believe that when leaders thrive, their their people thrive as well. Their people thrive as well, and that leads to profitable and equitable workplaces. So I'm really delighted to be here today. Thank you so much, Jess and Ishreen. Thank you, Jenny. Hello, everybody. My name's Ishreen Ishreen Bradley, and in my consulting, coaching, training, and advising practice we enable senior leaders and their teams to achieve the clarity the courage and the confidence to achieve their diversity equity inclusion and belonging goals and that stems from my passion for everybody having a fair crack at work wonderful thank you so much um, as you can see i have great quality speakers great quality coaches in the room uh, to have this discussion today but i also want to shout out to some of you here who are also um observing us and taking part uh jazz jay helen liam nyla you are all really really welcome and as i've said please do take part in the conversation so my first question for you um to bring your wealth of wisdom and expertise to is First of all, allyship is a term that get, gets used frequently these days. Um, we do hear it a lot, um, uh, uh, and there are, you know, there's some great books about allyship. Um, Her Allies by Hera is a fantastic book. Um, from your perspective as an executive coach, how do you guide leaders to move beyond performative allyship and truly champion inclusion in their leadership style and actions? And, and perhaps what are some of the common pitfalls leaders fall into um, that they can avoid? Because I think we may have some leaders here who are thinking, oh, I, I think I'm doing it all right already. Um, but it's really good to help them think and challenge themselves about what they're currently doing. But also some people might not be familiar with the term performative allyship. So to help them consider what that might be. And I'm gonna start off with you, Joseph, if that's all right. Yes, um, certainly. Yes, allyship is, is, like you said, is a term that's used widely. And what does it mean to, to individuals? For me as an executive coach, I'll go back to the person, the individual who, who's looking at this. What does this mean for you? How, how well do you know yourself to know where you may have privilege where you may be of assistance, of support to other people who do not have the same as you. Now, you may be disadvantaged in one or more places, but there are places where you might be ahead of other people and therefore in a position as a leader to um, lend them either your voice or your actions. There's a quote um, from Melinda Epler uh, uh, in one of our talks where she says, change happens one person at a time, one act at a time, one word at a time. So it, uh, as an individual, as a leader, the person that you are, knowing what's important to you, how could you lend a voice, an action, 
or other support to the people you lead so that they can feel lifted up to 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 perform and to be well at work i love that joseph because i think sometimes it can feel very overwhelming um that sense of what we have to do and knowing one action at a time can, i think really really help so yeah i couldn't agree more there might be a bit of interference so what i might ask is if everyone can themselves when they're not speaking and then just unmute when you are because I'm not sure where it's where it's coming from but yeah love that point thank you Joseph and a really good start for us to think actually let's not get overwhelmed by this let's take one step at a time so over to you Ishreen thank you Jenny so at Belonging Pioneers we define being an ally similar to what Joseph said as being a person who benefits from their relative privilege due to not being from a particular underrepresented group. Um, so that group might be around their gender, around their race, around their age, like that, right? So because you've got that relative privilege as opposed to an absolute privilege, um, you are then able, if you want to, to make a conscious effort to ensure social justice for one group or more. And, the essential thing is it needs to be a group that you connect with from the heart. So beyond performative, which is just saying, oh, I'm an ally for everyone and really not taking concrete steps, you're using your relative privilege in a particular area to empower and enable people from that underrepresented group. And you're doing that consciously. So how we work with um, leaders to move beyond it being performative allyship is by exploring at a really profound level where they have that kind of relative privilege, where they have a genuine intention to make a difference, and then start building that bridge from their intentions to palpable contribution by developing their ability to be inclusive in their leadership of that particular underrepresented group. And Jenny, you asked about pitfalls as well. So a, a common pitfall um, that I see is when my clients start on this journey, they can tend to become a bit overenthusiastic and start calling out people publicly. And that can be counterproductive. So we have to coach very carefully to make sure they don't do that um, because that can embarrass the person you're calling out. Um, and then that ostracizes them and that makes them go in the opposite direction to where you want them to go which is to be a better ally so that's that's a pitfall definitely that i would encourage leaders to look out for thank you jess what would you add to that I'll take myself off mute. Um, I, I think um, I'd really take Ishreen's point. And I, I think part of it as well is um, thinking that sometimes you can remain quiet just to, to be comfortable. Um, and actually, it's, it's, it's more than just remaining comfortable, because if you protect feeling comfortable and you sit back and you don't say anything because you, you, know, you don't want to rock the Pope, you're not making any difference. But actually thinking about what can you do, what small step can you take um, and don't worry about getting it wrong. Um, but then any action that you do take, make it sustained. So, you know, follow it up, see what the, the, the impact has been, see what you can do more of, you know, and keep going. And if you do make a mistake, don't let that sort of stop you or make you retreat. Actually, just keep on going because every step that you take can make a difference. Completely agree. And, and I think, um, I, I hope I can say that probably every one of us in this room has made a mistake. I definitely have um, when it comes to moving forward with inclusion. Uh, and I've taken it as a learning opportunity. Um, yeah. And, and I think that's what we have to do. But if we, we don't take any chances, if we don't try, we're just not going to move forward. Um, so this is really important. Hira, what would you add? Um, I, I think first, um, I do want to acknowledge this, that the term allyship itself is getting a lot of backlash these days because some people think it's come across as patronizing. Um, and personally, I believe it's important not to get too caught up in terminology, but to focus on meaningful, concrete action. 
Um, today I was sharing a post about genuine allyship, and I think you talked about performative allyship versus genuine allyship. Um, I believe performativism is, is very common, um, and it's not just about what you say publicly, but also what you do behind closed doors when the communities that you're supporting aren't there to witness it. It's, it's not about devising, avoiding divisive or con uncomfortable topics, just like uh, Jess said, not rocking the boat just to maintain likability. It's also not about getting defensive or angry when you're challenged and criticized. Um, and essentially, I think it's just about saying the right things online, but also living those values offline. One thing which I feel particularly strongly about is it's about championing all groups of people and not just whom you share an affin affinity with. That's very common in allyship. Uh, yes, we are certainly more informed about certain groups, but that doesn't mean that you only speak about those, those groups and, and leave the rest behind. Um, and in terms of, of pitfalls, I feel, I feel there are two pitfalls. I mean, there are two ends of the spectrum. So one end is waiting too long to speak up, hoping for the perfect moment, the perfect message. And yes, language matters and it's critical, but sometimes you won't get it right and that's okay. We all make mistakes. And at the other end of the spectrum is the savior complex where you assume you know best and act without consulting the very communities that you want to support. So I think true allyship is in the middle, being willing to step up, even if it's imperfectly, but also learning with humility from the people that you aim to uplift. Love that. Really, really wonderful points from all of you on this idea of what I think it's important to consider this backlash to allyship. And I think it's people, um, no one wants to be saved. You know, that's the thing, isn't it? We don't need to be saved. And it can feel like you're trying to save people. Um, uh, and that's not what you want to do. You want to walk alongside them. So sometimes it, you know, even with best intentions, something that we try and do cannot be received well, but that doesn't mean we stop. And I think that's what happens too often. We try something, it doesn't quite work. And then we retreat and maybe even go back further than we were in the first place. And it's about how do I keep stepping forward, even though I may have slipped on the path I'm going to keep moving forward. I'm not going to run back into my home uh, where it's safe because the, it, where there's a destination um, where we want to go and it's a good place to be. Thank you all so much. So I've got a second question for you, um, which is, can you truly lead if you're not an ally, which is at the heart of this conversation? So how does a leader's own self-awareness and willingness to confront their own biases impact their ability to create an inclusive environment where everyone feels they can belong. What's the role of vulnerability in fostering genuine connections and trust across difference? Um, so yeah, this is that, this is the next question and it's more about the individual leader. I'm gonna start with you, Jess. Okay, thanks, Jenny. So, you know, we know that great leadership is about being able to, you know, appreciate different perspectives, to understand, people to be able to be empathetic and these are all traits which will help you in your allyship as well so in as part of that part of being a great leader allowing yourself to be vulnerable so being able to say when you don't know being able to admit that you don't have all the answers being able to, to ask those around you because they will have a different perspective and they will have a different lived experience and also you know to the earlier point being able to be prepared to be wrong and to make mistakes you know being you know there's a vulnerability that comes with being able to admit that you're making a mistake or that you don't know something and so all of these things if that leader can demonstrate these things they're creating the, the inclusive environment through their action not just through their words and actually when people can see that you know that leader is doing things from the right place it really then engenders that trust Mm, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I want to acknowledge Nyla and Jazz for their wonderful comments in the chat. And just to let you know, we will come back to you um, uh, responding to any questions that you've made um, uh, shortly and not too long. But yeah, some really good, great nuggets there, Jess. Thank you so much. Um, Ishreen. Unmute. There we go. Thank you, Jenny. So I believe that it's always been critical as a leader to create an inclusive environment. I think the main difference in today's work environment 
is that there's more diversity and there's more awareness of diversity. Therefore, the complexity of being inclusive has moved. It's moved beyond a mono identity, which is how it was pretty much when I started work 40 years ago, through to a monoculture. So let's, you know, we're a multinational organization, we're British owned. So let's export this British culture to all the countries that we operate in. It's what I described by monoculture. So people in Egypt would be being given the same leadership development and cultural awareness program as somebody in Basingstoke, which was quite challenging and not probably the most useful. Um, so, you know, in a monoculture, everybody needed to behave the same. Um, and now we've moved to a more integrated, diverse environment because there are more diverse people. Um, and so we do need to be more knowledgeable in how we're inclusive of different kinds of people. So I guess I, I believe it's possible to lead in this culture without being a fully informed ally for all groups. So, you know, the way I defined it was relative privilege, knowing your relative privilege and choosing who you're going to be an ally for, because I think it's not humanly possible to be an authentic ally as I defined it for all underrepresented groups in what I consider to be a meaningful way. Um, so what I think is important is to have an ally mindset and uh, what I mean by that is that it's essential to be inclusive of all groups, um, whether they're representative groups or underrepresented groups. And how you can do that is by employing some essential leadership skills, really, things like empathy and walking in another's shoes. And uh, many that Jess described when she was speaking um, so that you can build that sense of shared purpose that helps you and your colleagues to achieve the desired commercial and social returns. And what that requires of you is a willingness to know how your actions and the actions of others make a colleague feel, to catch yourself, as Jess said, when you find yourself oppressing someone who might have a different relative privilege from you, and repair that oppression in an equitable way. So um, one of the things that's new that you'll need to learn to be an inclusive leader is to develop your cultural intelligence in this space. Lovely. Thank you. I guess the question comes to me as I listen to you and, and maybe others will speak to it is what if, you know, as has happened maybe previously, people have been an ally to women, but not to women of colour. So they're choosing who to support, but they, you know, they they say they're supporting women, but they aren't, aren't quite supporting exactly. all women. So, so there's a yeah, that's a really great question, Jay. So wh where that comes from and where this philosophy comes from is that your relative privilege isn't just your gender, isn't just your race. It can be, I'm going to be an ally for black women. I'm mm. going to be an ally for neurodiverse black women. I'm going to be an ally for neurodiverse black women who are mothers, you know? So... Um, the, the philosophy is really about if enough of us choose to be an ally and focus on being experts at being allies for that particular group, then we'll have a good coverage of everybody. Okay, I've got more to say on that, but I'm not going to say any more because <laughs> I'll end up speaking too much. Uh, Hira, what are your thoughts and the questions there? <laughs> Um, I love the term relative uh, privilege, um, Shreen. I think that is such a nice term. Uh, but also to your point, I do believe that, yes, there we, we might have an affiliation with certain groups and we might have more awareness by certain groups as a result of which we're speaking about them more. Um, but also in the process, just being conscious that you don't exclude other groups. That That's what I would add. But I wanted to especially address your perspective on recognizing your own biases. I do believe that's a very critical question, Jenny, because if you're not aware of your own biases and you regularly dismiss the concept of bias as a dirty word, how can you acknowledge when others are biased? 
And if you don't recognize your own prejudices and begin to work on them, how can you expect to address those in others? If you don't start with yourself, how will you recognize these patterns in others? So definitely interrupt your own limiting beliefs uh, and partialities first and foremost before you can challenge others. And Jess has already highlighted great points, uh, as has Ishreen about vulnerability. But I do believe that vulnerability is actually a likable leadership trait that helps in creating psychological safety when leaders are open about their failures and their shortcomings and sharing personal experiences when they have learned to act differently um, and saying, yes, you know what, this is something which I was doing, but now I know better, so I'm doing it differently. It encourages others to do the same. It, it just fosters an atmosphere where people understand that it's okay to make mistakes, it's okay not to be perfect, but it's what you do after making that mistakes that truly matters. Yeah, I think the other great thing is that you, you know, everyone who's listening to this, you are listening to some great coaches. And what great coaches are good at doing is asking really good questions. And I would encourage you to look at the materials that all of these coaches have created, whether it's books, whether it's articles, because they will pose those great questions that help you understand yourself uh, in order to be able to move forward. Um, and there is some work to do on yourself first. Joseph, what would you like to add? Yeah, it's just to add um, on that point of vulnerability, it's permission to others. Is what permission, you, when you are being vulnerable, you are giving others permission to be vulnerable, which means bringing their whole selves into work. And oftentimes people keep a part of themselves outside work and therefore they don't give you everything, they don't bring everything that they could bring into, into work. Now, regarding um, uh, leadership in today's world, leadership, um, the way it used to be, the, is top down. In today's world where the, the, uh, many of the people you, uh, one is leading, are not wedded to the company or to the organization. They'll move if they're not uh, comfortable, if they're not happy. And if you take that on board then, as a leader, knowing what it is you want to, um, what, what, what biases you have, and how does that um, uh, interface with the group that you want to um, uh, to be an ally for. So, for example, let's say you want to be an ally for uh, people with disabilities. If you don't ex examine what biases you, you might have um, about that group personally, you may find yourself making assumptions about them, misunderstanding things about them, which will lead you down the wrong direction. So I think that that, that that part of self-awareness and the willingness to confront one's own biases is crucial as a, a core part of going forward. Now, you can then walk alongside people rather than over them. And um, you can understand where they are coming from in order to do things or take actions that will be supportive of them. Now, regarding the... the um, the, the, how how people feel in that environment. If you think, Jenny, to your question, if you think that I'm doing this for one particular group to the exclusion of everybody else, you narrow the thinking. But if you, for, for example, focus on one particular group, but be aware that as your mind opens to what the needs of this group are, you also allow yourself to wonder what other groups might need you then become a leader taking action on one group but aware of the opportunities that come up to then address issues for other groups. It becomes much more inclusive as a leadership uh, um, a style than just focusing on one and going to the exclusion of everyone else. Thank you. That's a helpful insight for all of us. Um, and some really good tips there. Um, I've got an example of what you what you said, actually. So someone, it was um, a man from a South Asian uh, background, um, was in a meeting and he didn't speak up. 
and someone decided to be an ally and say, oh, are you feeling excluded? You know, you're not speaking in the meeting. And he just said, actually, I just didn't have anything to say. <laughs> there was no feeling of exclusion, isolation, imposter syndrome. None of that was going on. I just didn't have anything to communicate at that point. And that sort of sense, exactly what you're saying, you know, we can make assumptions. Oh, because of his South Asian heritage, he was the only, South mm -hmm. from that, you know, from that background in the room, he felt like this. And we do have to be careful not to put people in boxes and make those assumptions um, and try and save people who actually don't need saving. Um, yeah. So, um, yes, thank you very much for highlighting that point and many others. So the final question before we go to questions from uh, the audience, and I can see a couple already. Thank you all for your your thoughts and your insights. Um, so the question I would like to ask you is, so there are many leaders who express good intentions when it comes to diversity and inclusion. Um, how can executive coaching, and you are all, the, you know, the, as far as I'm concerned, you are uh, from the top group of executive coaches in this country. Uh, you're all highly qualified, highly experienced, um, uh, and uh, have everything, every measure of what we would class as a, a top executive coach. So how can executive coaching help leaders translate those intentions into concrete actions and measurable outcomes? What are some specific strategies or frameworks that you've found to be effective in driving real change in organizations? Um, and I'm going to start with Hira, I think. Yes, Hira, this one. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm already not on mute. Thank you for asking that, Jenny. Um, I, I think executive coaches can play such a critical role because a lot of the calling in or calling out can be done in, in, an, in a very nice way, I would say, in a non-confrontational way where you, you encourage people to reflect on their biases and then reflect on how uh, they can challenge others. So I follow my own uh, framework. As you know, my book's tagline is translating positive intentions into meaningful action. Um, and my, my process is simple. I begin by asking people to challenge themselves, right? Talking about how you can reflect on your biases, your privileges, um, your behaviors, acknowledging responsibility and understanding how this can influence your, pers your pers own perspective and actions. Um, and of course, committing to ongoing self-education and growth. And then you move on to challenging others, speaking up when you witness discrimination. And of course, of course, there are a number of ways to do that, but also gently exploring what is it that is holding them back from speaking up and trying to give them that confidence or you know, even the knowledge to be able to challenge others. Finally, you move to challenging organization culture. You then address and confront biases and equities within the institution that you're part of advocating for inclusive policies, practices, representation. Um, and ultimately, and I usually don't talk about this because people think, oh my God, this is a lot. But challenging institutions working towards systemic change by influencing broader institutional structures and policies like education and, and politics and, and so on and so forth. But I do feel that coaches can play such a, a significant role in in allowing people to be better allies uh, to, to communities and to different groups that they want to support. Thank you. It's very comprehensive and there's a lot there. Um, I, I guess uh, the key is for people to speak to you and contact you afterwards for more detail because you can't cover it all in, in this short time. Um, but I've also put a link to your book in the chat um, for anyone who wants to pick that up because I think that would be really helpful. I'm going to go to Joseph next. <laughs> Thank you. I sent you a subliminal message there to ask. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think for, for, for me in terms of, of our, our coaching work that whatever anybody wants to do and does it effectively, they must know why they want, they, they, they want to do this for themselves for their future, for the for the organization, whatever it is. So going back into that question is, um, what the conversation I would have with the individual is, what are you doing this for? And how does that relate to what you really want for yourself in terms of your personal values, but also your vision of your leadership, your vision of your future? Now, when those two things align, 
the rest, the what and the when and the how tend to be energized and then happen. So that conversation, which might could be quite in depth, is to what what's this for, and how does this align with what's really important to you, align to the future you have uh, or you want. Now, in that conversation, the opportunity will then come up to say, what actions do I as uh, see? Uh, to, to move forward, because as a coach, I cannot impose my agenda about allyship on them. It's got to be something that comes from them to then take forward. And that conversation would then lead to what is it you want to do and how do you want to go about it? What have you attempted in, in previously and what has not worked? There are lessons in all these, either from the successes or from the times when you've fallen on your face and you've picked yourself up bearing in mind that those same um, um, actions or the, whatever learning comes from that comes from there also happens in other aspects of leadership. So this is not just about allyship, it's about leadership. So seeing it in the round of, as a leader, what do I do when I make a mistake in front of my chief executive? What do I just sit back down or do I pick myself up and learn lessons and go again. It's the same thing. It is leadership after all. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm going to go to Ishreen. Thank you, Jenny. So once we've got to the why they want to be an ally and what they want to get out of it, what I call the intentions and the outcomes, and we get to work on that. I found that four things really get in the way, and this is my framework. Um, so the four things are inertia, complacency, opacity, and conformity. And those are the four barriers that have to be worked through in the coaching. So if you imagine, this is a big deal. It's a big challenge that a coach he takes on, whether they're a senior leader or a leader or a middle manager in an organization, it's huge. So the first thing to think about is, it's kind of like starting up the submarine. And starting up the submarine takes a huge amount of energy and that's needed to get over the inertia. So what that looks like in coaching is really working to understand themselves, their colleagues, the organizational culture, but it starts with the self and the, the fear of getting it wrong, the fear of saying the wrong thing or being ostracized or being labeled. So really working to overcome those fears and to overcome the implicit cultural bias. So um, especially, I do a lot of work in financial services and technology, and and there are cultural biases around certain skills being more important than others, and really working through that, and the the general resistance to change, the stickiness of those ingrained subcultures and structures and practices, and the reluctance to disrupt them and be able to address those difficult topics like microaggressions. So that's all got to be worked through in overcoming inertia. Then we have complacency. So that, that's usually due to a lack of awareness based on, um, as Hira and um, everybody said before, based on biases, things that we're not even aware of that will affect the fairness and opportunity that's available to others. So what's really important um, in this space is inclusive leadership and having cultural intelligence. We do a lot of work in that area. Um, cultural intelligence, um, I think Helen said that's a, a new term. It is a relatively new term, but there's already data around this to say that only 24% of leaders actually have what's called cultural intelligence. So you can see there's a lot of work to do around that. Um, they also tend to overestimate the current level of inclusivity. So I was at um, Amazon Web Services last week and also at Women in Science and Engineering Wise at their conference, and I came across leaders who kind of thought they had it sorted. And then as we have the conversation, they realize actually we're not inclusive as an individual, we're not inclusive as an organization. So really that, that realization 
and then overcoming the conversation about time and resources. Uh, the, the next stage is opacity. So this we're all familiar with the lack of data, the lack of clear metrics when you go through this process and the lack of diverse representation and perspectives. And some people will sort of say, oh, well, you know, it's scarce, we can't get it. And you work with them to show where they can find it. And then the, the final space is conformity. So the tendency to give in to peer pressure when people are saying, do you know what, we're fine as we are, why do you want to bother with this? Um, the pressure to culturally assimilate, um, you know, we've got long standing cultures and practices, why, you know, let's leave it as it is. And the barriers of communication in being able to address those kinds of um, resistance. So that's that's kind of how how we go through it. Thank you. Very comprehensive response. And um, please do get in touch with Ashreen if you want to know more about her framework. Um, we're going to go to Jess um, um, and then we're going to open up to your questions. And I can see at least three questions that we can respond to. So thank you for your questions that you've been sharing. So Jess, uh, you might want to offer a different perspective on this question. Yeah, yeah, I do. So I think then some good points have been made, particularly with starting with the individual, starting with the why, particularly with executive coaching. You know, we we like to start from a good foundation with our clients and starting with why and understanding why, you know, as Joseph rightly said, then helps with the, 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 the how and the what. But in terms of a specific strategy to really help um, leaders who have these good intentions is reciprocal mentoring. And I've seen reciprocal mentoring work really, really well um, in the sense that it's an opportunity for that leader to hear directly and um, from somebody who's walking in the shoes of maybe that person who is marginalised. Um, so they can get some really specific strategies on how they can be an ally um, when they hear these direct experiences um, and, and they have a two-way exchange as well. Um, and, and I know that sometimes there can be a bit of a power imbalance when you look at reciprocal mentoring and sometimes people wonder, you know, that trust can be an issue. But I do think that designing the alliance at the beginning and then ensuring that both parties are aligned um, and also agree that it's going to be a meaningful exchange can really help the leader to be a better ally um, because not only does it mean that they have this um, intelligence and this information which can help them it also means that they are inadvertently and directly empowering that sort of more junior colleague um, and I think when they also agree as an ally to use their power or their experience or their expertise to support that junior colleague who's mentoring them that can really be um, a good strategy to really help and um, it goes beyond just intentions but to action as well. Brilliant, thank you. Really great point to end on in terms of the questions I was going to ask. So much information, really helpful information you've all um, shared and I'm hoping everyone's taking away at least one key action from today's conversation. But I'd love to start answering some of the questions that we've had. And the first is from Nyla. Um, she supports the point about calling out and cancelling people who are not yet allies. Um, but how can we take a bigger picture view and call in as opposed to call out? Because we need safe spaces to inspire people. Um, so any who would like to respond to that point? Um. I, okay, sorry. Here, should we go no, here, Joseph? Or do you, Joseph, or just, go ahead, please go ahead. Yeah, no, um, it's about the calling out. Um, I'm not sure how helpful it often is. If we realize that in the society we have, especially with the social media and everything else, if you can easily lose control of what the intention is when you do the calling out. And, and I think that if we realize that we each make mistakes and we say that failure is, the, is often the foundation for success, when you are calling out somebody, fine, you may have the courage to do it, but what of the compassion for someone who's like you and who would respond to being held whilst they learn? So it's a fine balance to 
to to to to to to have about the the when do you call somebody out who so that they can um, have their repercussions for what they've done, but how does that person get to learn? And I think it's a therefore a fine balance. Hera, please. No, I think that's a great point. I completely agree with that. Um, I personally do believe in calling in rather than calling out uh, because I believe that if you do not engage with people using empathy, then people will just get further discouraged. There's just a very simple rule I follow, whether you should be calling it out publicly or privately. Um, and the rule I follow is that if the perpetrator is genuinely misinformed or immature, <clears throat> but is well-intentioned, or if they come from an older generation or culture, which is possibly out of touch with changing values, then a private call in might be suitable, and especially if no one is specially targeted or effective. Or if you share a positive relationship with the individual, then facilitating a productive side discussion might be beneficial. But on the other hand, if someone is habitual perpetrator, unapologetic and says things maliciously, uh, inappropriate jokes again and again, despite knowing better, then I think it may be necessary to call it out and call out the behavior publicly. So really also depends on the nature of what it is that you're trying to call in or call out. Lovely. Really great. Thank you. Um, really good answers there, I think. And I, I hope that feels like a comprehensive answer to you, Nyla. Thank you for the question. So the next one is that I think um, the term cultural intelligence was brought into the conversation. Um, and uh, Helen says she loves the term. Um, and any tips on developing cultural intelligence? Helen, happy to have a longer conversation with you about it. But the a very easy thing to do is to watch movies or read books uh, that feature people who've been advocates for equitable and inclusion in the world, you know, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, so forth. And, and there you'll find a lot of insight into how different cultures operate. Can I also add it's, it's this curiosity as well, always remaining curious because, you know, you there are so many, everybody has so many layers to their identities and actually if you have those conversations, don't be afraid to have conversations and be curious about, you know, what you're hearing, that helps to develop your cultural intelligence as well as you, you know, you hear from others. Okay, yeah, great. I, I think there's also, Helen, so much work around cultural intelligence. Um, the work of David Livermore is worth having a look at um, and, and many others where uh, there's a lot of research being done. Um, cultural intelligence and also particularly for global organisations, thinking about how people work together, how they communicate, how they make the best of each other, how they celebrate difference. Um, and how you lead across difference. So there's a, there's a lot, a lot out there and it's really worth exploring. So, we yeah, also great. have a webinar, Jenny. Uh, we did a webinar, Cultural Intelligence. You may oh, also yeah. want to share the link later. Yeah, yeah. good point. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. Really, really helpful. Great. So we have another question from um, Nyla as well which is, um, seems like a no brainer. In your opinion, what stops more leaders from embracing an allyship mindset and behaviors in their teams and broader cultures? Um, I, I, I'd say it's the four things that I covered, Nyla, inertia, complacency, opacity, and conformity. Okay. I think um, as, as, as leaders as well, um, often the, 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 the impression that you are expected to get it right all the time. You are being looked up to, to be the, the model. But actually, if you're working with people who you expect to make mistakes, get it wrong, pick themselves up and go again, what uh, I think that discomfort, therefore, around being perfect, it's something that the, the leader themselves needs to address. Where is that coming from? Because that's not what you expect from the people beneath you. Perhaps you don't expect that from the people above you. So where is that coming from? And exploring what assumptions are you making 
about being perfect that you need to actually look in the face and and realize that they are just assumptions they're not the reality of of living and working with people uh, one of the things um oftentimes it's said that bringing people having a diverse team makes better working actually it makes it tougher to work because people have to work harder at understanding people. It's not just bringing people together, but when you are together as diverse people, you've got to invest. And part of that investment is in yourself in make, knowing that you'll get it wrong sometimes, but how do you then pick yourself up and keep the other person who has been hurt by your actions, keep them engaged and, uh, and pr producing uh, as you want them to produce or being in in a good place at work brilliant thank you thank you so i just want to draw on a point made um as opposed to a question first of all so michelle says i'm currently in a leadership class as an executive coach and the subject of being aware of your workspace culture came up i find that to be extremely important especially when it comes to diversity and equity being able to be diverse in work cultures, the success of the business, as well as the actual people who are diverse in cultures. So I just wanted to bring that point because um, it's a reinforcement of the things that have been said here and how key this topic is um, from someone who's actually experiencing it. And um, we do have one, I'm gonna check if it's, I'm not sure if it's a rhetorical question or if it's a question, Jazz, but we'll put it up anyway. <laughs> so um, during the Second World War, allies served at a particular remit to fight for a common call for change. With diversity, inclusion, equity and belonging programs, what is the common call for change that people connect to personally in teams and organizational levels? I feel the call is, is different at different scales and scopes, but is there a common spirit, do we think? So what's the big question? So I have been, I actually was thinking about this just this morning um, about how the term allies was used in the different wars. Um, I think there is a common spirit that is to defend um, you know, people who are in trouble or who are being attacked. Uh, so that, that common theme is there, but I just want, to be careful in pointing out that sometimes it can be problematic not to be calling out allies who are not doing something appropriately or because you know, sometimes you feel that I'm an ally so I can't say anything to this person but that's that's just a very wrong concept of allyship I think if you are an ally then you need to be able to call out when um, you know boundaries are being crossed or if your ally is doing something inappropriate so I think from from that perspective allyship is very different from what happens in, in you know in wars or in you know generally what happens in the organization in, in countries these days but overall I think the spirit is to to, to be able to support the, those people who are being oppressed or who are under some kind of attack. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's what I would say. I mean, there's a lot to say, but obviously I'm just going to keep it uh, narrow at this point in time. Jenny, I, I think that the common spirit, or Jazz, I think the common spirit here is inclusivity. It's, I think that's across, uh, across the piece around the DIB programs it's inclusivity, people uh, bringing people together to do whatever or to be um, whatever is desired. And I, I think if that is kept in mind, then the narrowness and yes, whether you're calling somebody out to protect somebody else, you're calling somebody in to educate them, to protect somebody else, all of it is around inclusivity so that we can all be in a space working towards a particular course and being bringing all our strengths fully into that space. Jazz, I, uh, hi Jazz, by the way, lovely to see you here. Um, I think this is a very complex question and in my experience, there's no one size fits all answer tends to vary by generation, tends to vary by function. And I think when we're working with organizations, we have to look at all the complex threads, look at the purpose of the organization and look at how we can find something that everybody can align with. 
I, I think that's a perfect end for us. Um, really great. I think you've been definitely challenged by <laughs> the great questions that have been asked today. And I want to thank you so much for your contributions. They've they've been amazing. They've been thought provoking. Um, I think actually they've been challenging and bold. Um, and I think I think that's what we need to be. I think as well as being kind, um, uh, but we need to be direct. Um, and I think as well as being careful, we need to we need to be bold in order to ensure things continue to move forward. So I want to say a huge thank you to you, Hira, Joseph, Jessica and Ishreen, and of course, the whole audience for attending today. Um, we've also put some links in the chat. The first is to the Diverse Executive Coach Directory, a directory which connects corporate organisations with coaches from uh, the global majority. Um, so there's a link there. You can find these coaches who you've been hearing from today directly there um, and connect with them, as well as connecting with them on LinkedIn, of course. Our next event is on the 26th of November. Uh, and uh, I think you'll really enjoy that the next event, actually. I think you'll, um, so I, I do encourage you to sign up and the link is in the chat. Um, uh, and, and I think, you know, these are about starting a conversation. You know, that is the key to start a conversation. You don't get everything from a one hour webinar. But it starts a conversation and it helps you think a little bit more. Um, and you might all have employee resource groups in your organizations. But actually, what do you know about what they do, what they go through, how they lead, the impact they can make, um, how tough it can be to do a lot to run alongside your day job? So we're really going to be thinking about how we can empower employee resource groups or community groups um, for the future. So do join our next webinar. And the last thing in the chat is a survey, because we always like to know what was useful about our webinars, what we could do better, what topics you want to hear from us in the future as well. So three things. Connect with our coaches, number one. Number two, sign up for our next event. We'd love to see you there. And lastly, please do create, um, do um, complete is the word I'm looking for. Do complete the survey. So a last big thank you uh, to Ishreen, Hira, Jess and Joseph. Brilliant coaches. And I want to say goodbye and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.